Welcome to Sir Henry Fraser, His Life in Focus. I'm Miles Eversley, thanks for joining us. In our last episode, Sir Henry discussed his role of lecturer and public orator with the University of the West Indies. This week, he continues the series by recounting the experience of establishing what is now known as the George Allen Chronic Disease Research Centre. One of the major activities in my life has been research and I was trained in research through first of all my first degree in physiology done as an intercalated BSc in London and going back to UWI afterwards and that physiology training taught us as medical students something about research philosophy, uh, analyzing data that had been published and so on. And then when I was doing my final uh, serious specialty training in London after I had acquired my membership of the Royal College of Physicians and done all the gastroenterology and neurology I wanted to do, I then did a PhD in pharmacology. So I became what is called a clinical pharmacologist. Now I tried on coming back to the Caribbean to do as much as I could in terms of research and to bring along younger people so that my residents, the, the junior doctors who worked as interns and registrars, I got them involved in research programs. But I realized that although I could produce modest research of a minor nature, sometimes very valuable research, but still limited in terms of the size of the projects that you could undertake, I realized that Barbados was not really playing the role it should play. We were not doing the things that we should be able to do. So my vision was to make Barbados, in turn, once again, an important site of medical research, as in the days of Hillary and in the days of Dr. Bailey in the 1930s. And this, this inspiration was something that I felt very strongly about. And, you know, I've often quoted the famous Jonathan Swift, the 17th century writer from Ireland, who said that vision is what some people have which other people cannot see. And so my vision was that we could be a model for an epidemiological society. We had the infrastructure, we had the good roads, we had the telephones, we had the lights and lighting power that worked, telephones that worked. We could communicate with people. We were a small island, only 166 square miles, and therefore doing epidemiological research or any other kind of research on people was possible. And it was possible to do it in an efficient way because of our infrastructure. So I had this vision that we could create serious research in Barbados. And it was very funny, our attempts to get this across because it was suggested that perhaps I needed an expert from somewhere to assist me in my feasibility study. And so PAHO, Pan American Health Organization, through its director, here in Barbados, uh, Dr. Hal Dyer, who had taught me, slightly older man from Montserrat, he was directing PAHO here. And we had a discussion with the director of CAREC, and he knew a just retired public health physician in Canada who would come down and make an assessment of the Barbadian situation. Well, he came. And I spent several days showing him everything that I could think of and having him meet all the right people, the principal of the university, Sir Keith Hunt, the chief medical officer, the minister of health, the permanent secretary, visiting the polyclinic, showing him Barbados to see for himself why I felt we could do this kind of important research. Well, he went back and he wrote a very brief report saying that Henry Fraser was much too busy to make a success of this kind of project. And he really couldn't recommend it. <laughs> Luckily, Sir Keith and Professor Walren, Professor, now Sir Errol Walren, Mickey, they were both strongly supportive. So the next task I had was to find a building which I could establish as a research center. I was shown the virtually demolished, ransacked and wrecked old laboratory of the hospital which had been operating in the 1940s and 50s. Uh, there was no roof and there were lots of birds living there. And then I was shown the National Nutrition Center which had been built on the swamp of the Delaware land and that was falling apart, drifting apart. When I assisted Sir Frank Ramsey in the National Nutrition Survey in 1979, the building had a crack about six inches wide 
between two sections of the building and it continued to move. So by, by 1991, when I was looking for a building, some 12 years later, the crack was about a foot wide. And it was obvious that doing anything with a building on a swamp was not a good idea. But luckily, I was shown this building which had been abandoned, the Avalon site, next to the Ina Walters roundabout. Now, this was a wonderful old building, built at least as early as the early 19th century, around 1800 or so. And it had been acquired by the hospital, by the government, and converted into apartments for doctors. Junior doctors had lived there. And when I had looked at that building, all that I saw was peeling paint. It had been abandoned basically because of peeling paint. You know in Barbados, when people see a building with peeling paint, they say knock it down. They think it's too old to be rescued or even maintained. So this wonderfully solid building with about 10 rooms was absolutely perfect for a chronic disease center to be set up. So I started with three rooms at the back where Dr. Alert and I worked hard for a couple of years and then I got the downstairs section and finally I got the upstairs wing where the hospital survey had been chaired by Sir Richard Haynes. They finally gave me that and that amazing building which now holds more than 20 people doing research all the time, that amazing building was restored fully for less than half a million dollars in three phases. So that's where the research centre began. Sir Keith Hunt was the first chairman of my advisory committee and I had a wonderful advisory committee with Sir Keith, Professor Walrond, I had Professor David Piku who succeeded Sir Keith as the chairman. He lived in Trinidad and he had been the director of the, nutrition, of the metabolic centre in Jamaica. And then I had the representative of the government, the chief medical officer and the permanent secretary for administrative roles and of course the director of CAREC who was Dr. James Hospital is a good friend. So I had wonderful people, all of whom I knew well. We, we had a permanent secretary in the Ministry of Health Ms. Um, who was absolutely wonderful, Mr. Lionel Weeks. He gave me tremendous support. I, I know of no permanent secretary who has been so good and so valuable to the concept of research in Barbados, which I'll come back to. So we established this, this advisory committee and we set up and I had a committee guided by a mission statement which Professor Piku and I worked the hardest on and I'm going to read that mission statement because I think it's so important. The mission statement was to improve the health of the population and to promote human development through research into the prevention and the management of the lifestyle related chronic diseases so as to inform national and regional health policies and programs, governmental and non-governmental. That was, in a sense, the mission and the guidelines for what we wanted to do with the Chronic Disease Research Center. And we had early studies which were very important. We did the International Comparative Study of Hypertension in Blacks, a collaboration established out of Chicago, and I was able to bring the Jamaicans in with the Tropical Medicine Research Institute, and they had a group in St. Lucia. So we were able to study what you might call the African diaspora, which had, as it moved across the Atlantic as far as Chicago, become more and more the victim of the chronic diseases. And that's an interesting and complicated theme that is worth explaining. In Africa, where we had so many chronic infectious diseases, especially malaria, with which some people lived, but not in the best of health, and sickle cell disease, which had a mild or moderate protective effect against malaria, but both of these conditions led to people being rather lean and hungry. And so there were none of the conditions of chronic diseases manifesting themselves because people simply did not get fat. Lives were lived hard, livelihoods were hard to achieve, and people were lean and, in a sense, lean and hungry and didn't have diabetes and high blood pressure. As they moved across the Caribbean, they came to St. Lucia, Jamaica, and Barbados. Now, the GDP of these countries is in that order, St. Lucia, Jamaica, Barbados and the GDP was closely linked with the development of obesity. When you went to Chicago, the GDP is even higher and the obesity is even greater. So when you plotted these features of our study subjects, 
in Nigeria and the Cameroon in Africa, St. Lucia, Jamaica, Barbados, and Chicago. What you found was virtually a straight line. Obesity increased between almost absent in West Africa to very highly prevalent in Chicago and Barbados just below. And with that obesity went the diabetes and the high blood pressure. So this was what we wanted to look at. And this was why we called the center the Chronic Disease Research Center. In a sense, it was both visionary and presumptive because I don't know of any other research center in the world with that specific label and that specific mission. Having set it up, therefore, we started with the international study and we went on to a local epidemiological study because I wanted to look at certain other things and we had the statistical unit guide us in designing a survey which incorporated, if you like, the middle class of Clapham and Wildey Heights, the working class of the old Clapham village and the in-between, if you like, of the pine housing area. So we had a limited geographical area of Bridgetown in which the statistical unit helped us to have a cross-section of people, from people who lived a basic traditional village life to those who lived in the Heights. And that was the Wildey study, and I have to give praise to the hard work of my young research fellow, and when I say fellow, I use that in the generic term, it was a lady, uh, Mrs. Kathy Charles now. Kathy was a uh, first class honors degree graduate in biology and I thought she was going to make a brilliant researcher and she would become one of the first female professors in medical research in Barbados at the Cape Hill University but after a year doing wonderful work on the Wilde study she moved into health and physical training as she is a gym trainer. But that Wilde study really defined what was going on in Barbados in an excellent way it was the women of Barbados who were much too fat, the men were much, much leaner, and the correlation with diabetes and hypertension was very, very strong. So that was one of the definitive early studies. We also looked at um, diabetes prevention and a number of other things, and then Dr. Anselm Hennis came back from Britain with his PhD in epidemiology, and he undertook the huge task of the Barbados Ice Studies started by Dr. Anthea Connell. She retired and went home to Britain and Anselm took that study on and he led phase three and then developed phase four of the famous Barbados Ice Studies. And I have to say here that the challenges I had in setting up the Chronic Disease Research Centre, the naysayers who thought it could not be done, those who thought I was building castles in the air, pie in the sky, one of the things that kept me going was the knowledge that we had identified a brilliant young man who was much brighter than me, Dr. Anselm Hennis, who did work with me as a junior doctor. We got him a, a place at the London School of Hygiene and the funding from the government to do that. And he came back and undertook a massive task of leading a number of studies. And so that in a sense, marked the transition from what I call the birth and the, the, the early days of the CDRC to what I then call the adolescence of the CDRC. This was a period where Dr. Hedis led multiple studies and one of his favorites was a study that we collaborated with Imperial College with the very well-known diabetologist, Dr. Uh, Nishi Chaturvedi and we did a study on diabetic amputees because uh, Dr. Alert had voiced that famous phrase that we were the amputation capital of the world. And it perhaps wasn't as bad as people might have thought because some of the amputations were merely the loss of a toe. But even losing a toe is a serious thing. Great discomfort and modifies people's physical ability. And Dr. Hennis, with his close relationship with Nishi, we were able to carry out a study looking at amputees and to demonstrate the risk factors in the diabetic patient for having an amputation, for leading to an amputation. That was a very valuable study. And one of the big things that stood out, there were several risk factors, but the biggest one was the ladies who were not accustomed to wearing high heels, but who would wear fashion shoes with high heels and accommodate this... Um, 
perhaps broader foot than the shoe was designed to fit in order to go to church on a Sunday. This came out with one of the biggest risk factors numbers that you could possibly imagine, leading to the higher number of amputations in women than in men. The other big study we did was with the guys in St. Thomas's Hospital in London, initiated as a result of the magnificent uh, networking and communication of Sir Kenneth Stewart. Now, Sir Kenneth Stewart was a, a very early member of staff of the University College Hospital in the West Indies in Jamaica, and he was in, living in London, and he had a close relationship as a council member, and he was able to help us to secure a very important grant looking at the care for diabetes and hypertension, the care of chronic diseases in Barbados compared with Trinidad and compared with Tortola. And we chose these three countries because Trinidad was one of the bigger countries. We could base the study between Barbados and Trinidad and we brought in Tortola because Trinidad was a country with a great deal of agriculture. So it was, it was much more agricultural than Barbados, which had become by this time much more of a service industry with tourism, while Tortola was a little island with nothing but tourism. And what we discovered really was that there was a typical and characteristic chain, if you like, pattern of these diseases with the Tortolan ladies being the largest of all, and the incidence of diabetes being the greatest. So those were the early days of the center. There came a point when I had a decision to make. How was I going to continue to be the director of the Chronic Disease Research Center, where the post had become full-time in 2000, and an integrated part of the Tropical Medicine Research Institute across the campuses, as well as being dean. I took the post of dean in 2001. Dr. Hennis, was so busy with so many multiple studies, although he was the obvious successor, he could not possibly have taken on the administrative burden. So it meant that I was actually doing two full-time jobs from 2001, at the beginning of my deanship, to 2005, for four years, doing two jobs, paid one salary, <laughs> and trying to cross the road between the hospital and the Chronic Disease Research Center on the other side of the roundabout. I became quite notorious for the big white hat that I would wear to protect me on those many trips across the road on foot. And it was an exciting period. It was a very challenging period. It was a very um, hard working period, I have to say. I was doing 12 hours a day and my wife had to be extremely supportive. It was wonderful when I could get off before sunset and actually leave the hospital and drive to Browns Beach, or Pelican Beach, and, and have a quick swim and swim out to the setting sun. I stopped that when I was told that the Barracudas came in when the sun was setting. So that sort of ended. But still, this was a very busy, busy, busy period, what I call the adolescence of the Chronic Disease Research Center. The teams were being built, the projects were being done, we had a lot of exciting work. I had Dr. Potter, who was a registrar, who came full time to manage the stroke study with, with Dr. Charles Wolfe from London. And that stroke study with Dr. Corbin as the neurology consultant, me as the leader, uh, Dr. Potter clinically, a wonderful nurse who was provided by the Ministry of Health because we were developing our partnerships. And one of the great success stories of the Chronic Disease Research Center is the partnership developed with the Ministry of Health. Initially, I think, the Ministry was suspicious of the Chronic Disease Research Center and what it could and should do. But we developed a wonderful partnership and they actually paid us the salary of that first nurse. And they have subsequently funded a number of major ongoing projects. But one of the exciting things was when Professor Landis joined us. Now, Clive Landis had done one of the brilliant things that an English person can occasionally do. He married a Barbadian. And after having three little children, uh, his wife said to Clive, you know, Clive, I cannot live in this godforsaken country in London where everything is so expensive and getting around is so awful. And I don't have my mother and my sister. I need them in order to raise my children. So Clive had heard about the Chronic Disease Research Center. He contacted me and he said, Henry, do you think we could possibly accommodate me in the Chronic Disease Research Center. Now, Clive is brilliant. Clive is, and I say this 
I say this quite openly, Clive is the brightest person I know personally. And he was a PhD in immunology and genetics, but his medical knowledge is as good as almost any doctor. And so I said, I've got to get this guy into the centre, because he is going to be wonderful for the centre. But there was no room for him to have bench space in the hospital. There was no room for him at the university, which had a very packed, tight science department. And, you know, one day I went by the pavilion, which was being restored, and I saw that the worksite office at the pavilion in Hastings was a shipping container. So I went into that shipping container, and what I saw was a container that had been converted into a modern office with plumbing, with electricity, with windows, doors, and everything. And I said, wow! And it was rather like um, when Archimedes had his brilliant insight about density by sitting in his bath and the water was displaced and he shouted, Eureka! I found it. So I shouted Eureka and I immediately called Clive in London. I said, Clive, do you think you could have a lab in a shipping container? Because a 40 foot container will give you 320 square feet and they can put everything in there that you need. And he said, what a wonderful idea. So I got the shipping container designed and worked on by the people up in Edgehill in St. Thomas. And we had the plumbing, we had the lights, we had the benches built, we had all the plugs, 220, 110 plugs. We had the fume cupboard that scientists need. We had this magnificent shipping container and the crane lifted it off the truck, off the, <laughs> the huge truck that brought it. The crane lifted it and put it down on the ground next to the CDRC where the door was prepared and it communicated with the CDRC. And so we had a state-of-the-art laboratory created from a shipping container and the work that Clive and his PhD students and technicians have done in that laboratory has been fantastic, producing a whole rash of scientific papers of great value. So that again is one of our wonderful success stories and I have to give credit to the founder and his son of Courts Limited. Uh, Peter Cohen has been an amazing funder supporting what Clive was doing, supporting our research and assisting us through his initial contacts with the university and Professor Wayne Hunt who was in charge of research as, as, as vice principal. Um, Peter Cohen funded that process and I have to say that that shipping container gave us a laboratory at about one-third of the cost of building a laboratory out of concrete blocks in the usual way. So it was not only brilliant, it was not only a solution, but it was an economical solution which was a great contribution to the ultimate success of the Chronic Disease Research Centre. We also were able to secure in this middle period the services of a brilliant medical statistician, and that's Ian Hamilton. And Ian Hamilton had been working in Jamaica at the TMRI. He, he left Jamaica and he was actually working in East Africa for a while, and we kept in contact. And when I thought it was possible, I was able to bring Ian here to a post at the CDRC. So we have this centre going. We are doing a lot of research. Dr. Hennis is working particularly hard. I'm running the centre as, as well as running the medical faculty. And one of the great successes, one of the great acclaims of the centre was when the university celebrated 60 years. And Vice Chancellor Harris decided that one way of celebrating 60 years was to recognise and publicise and award the outstanding researchers, the outstanding academics in the university under the age of 60. Now bear in mind that there are several hundred academic staff at the Cape Hill campus. There are even more at the St. Augustine campus in Trinidad and Tobago, and there are of course the greatest number, many hundred, in the university in Jamaica. We had five academic staff in our little research unit, and of the 60 stars of the university, we were awarded three stars, Landis, Hennis, and Hamilton. With a staff of five, we would have been extremely lucky to have a single star out of the three quarters of a thousand academic staff across the university. We would have been lucky to have one star, but we had three stars. 
So Professor Hennis, Professor Hambleton and Professor Landis really made history for the Chronic Disease Research Centre. And of course we know that when I then finally was able, with Professor Landis's help, to persuade uh, and Sam Hennis to take on the burden of administration, he then became the director succeeding me. And in this final phase of the centre, everything was going well. The, the Health of the Nation study was being funded, uh, the, the HOT study, as it were, the acronym HOT, Health of the Nation. And Dr. Landis's work was going well, and he and Professor Hennis were doing work with PhD students, so that suddenly the centre produced half a dozen PhD graduates and we had new staff joining us. So we had staff like Andre Greenwich working with, with Landis. We had Angie Rose, who was Guyanese. We had Kim Quimby, who had started as an intern working with us and got into research. And Kim is a tower of strength in every way at the centre. And we had Christine Howitt. These are some of the people who are part of the team at the centre. And I had a big poster in the centre with my philosophy, quoting Margaret Mead, who said, Never doubt that a small group of people working together can change the world. And that is what has happened at the centre, because in its maturity, it was praised highly by reviewers, both in the quinquennial review of the research centres and by the regional assessment of medical schools as being a world-famous centre producing valuable research for the world, not just the region, not just Barbados. So I'm very proud of the centre, which in later days has been named the George Aline Chronic Disease Research Centre. So George, of course, was my mentor. So this was an important accolade for the centre to have because he was the role model for research in the university. He became the director of PAHO, uh, one of the great University of the West Indies graduates. And when the then principal vice chancellor uh, Professor Hilary Beckles was looking around for an outstanding operation, if you like, to name for Sir George on his retirement. It was the George Aline Chronic Disease Research Centre. And no doubt, the groundbreaking research and contributions to the fight against chronic non-communicable diseases made by the centre honour the name of Sir George Aline. We invite you to join us next week at the same time as Sir Henry continues his autobiographical journey with his experiences as Dean of the Faculty of Medical Sciences. This has been Sir Henry Fraser, his life in focus. I'm Miles Eversley. Thanks for your time. <laughs>